One of my favorite aspects of Door Fortress is the amount of customization you have access to. The game by itself gives you nearly endless options, but once you crack open the Raws, it's as though you are playing God. The tools at your disposal range from small things like adding a kind of flower or gemstone you like to enormous changes like adding new industries or altering the theme of the game entirely. And the best part is, is that it's not that complicated. For example, a couple of years ago I slapped together an Ancient Greece themed Total Conversion mod in only a few days. The wildlife and civilizations reflected Greek history or mythology down to varied cultigens and the type of clothing, armor, and materials being used. The map was made using an application called Perfect World, but everything else was done by editing RAWs using Notepad. Even though this editing changed the face of the game completely, going as far as removing dwarves, the changes are relatively small compared to some of the more popular Total Conversion mods being passed around. Now, the RAWs can do everything. Some things are hard-coded, like terrestrial pathfinding and fortress mode, so you might be disappointed when embarking as an Eagle Man civilization. There's no feasible way to add something like a proper sewage system, though there are a few relevant material tokens. Site types are restricted to what Toadies already slapped together, and I ran into constant conflicts and limitations when trying to make functioning civilizations out of non-eating, non-sleeping, non-living things like firemen or amethyst men. Nonetheless, the amount you can do with them is pretty incredible, and I have yet to fully explore the possibilities myself. In the interest of making an easily digestible video, I'm not going to go enormously in-depth. I'm only going to cover a few examples of the kinds of changes I like to make when loading up a fresh download of the game. If you like the changes I'm making, I've included the modified files in the video description below for your use. I could say something like, Make sure to back up your files before blah blah blah. I've been editing RAWs for years, and I've never once made backup text files. I've also messed up badly and had to redo my RAWs from scratch. Take what you will from that. For those of you who aren't aware, the RAWs are located in the RAW folder of the game directory. I'm only going to be messing with a few things in the object files in this video. Now, there's a lot of stuff going on in here, and I'll be covering these other files in the future along with a more in-depth look into tokens, but for now I'm just going to demonstrate some small changes starting with the item weapon file. So we've been using battle axes to cut down trees for some time now, at least those of us who weren't using wooden training axes back when that was possible. Oh, Toady. To you I owe everything, and I know you've got a lot on your plate, but for how much longer must we fell trees with weapons of war? Well, at least we can take matters into our own hands and throw in something a little more flavorful. I'm copy and pasting the battle axe object Ross to use as a template for a woodcutting axe. I'm going to call it an axe so that it doesn't look out of place when wielded by a soldier. After naming it, I'm going to make it a little bit smaller as it's going to use less materials than a battle axe. And accordingly, I'm going to lower its two-handed value, which dictates how large a creature has to be to wield it with one hand. I'm going to touch up on the minimum value later, as I have plans for that. I'm taking off a bit of the material value, which will make it a little cheaper to embark with, as battle axes are outrageously expensive in embark points. I'm also lowering the weapon edge size and penetration numbers to make it clear that the battle axe is the superior choice for battle. Now, as some of you may know, there are a few weapons that you may come across in a human trade caravan that cannot be wielded by dwarves. It's actually not exactly because they're too big for the dwarves to use. Plenty of dwarves grow larger than the minimum size required to wield these weapons. It's because of a mistaken coding that checks for the creature's average size when attempting to wield instead of that specific creature's size. Now, I think it's a little lame to have access restricted to weapons due to a bug, so I'm going to lower the minimum size down to below 60,000 so dwarves will be able to get their hands on them. This applies to the pike, halberd, two-handed sword, maul, and great axe. Also funny note about the axe weapon token. This is what determines if a weapon can be used for cutting down trees, so you might have woodcutter migrants walk in holding halberds or great axes with these numbers tweaked. The last change I'm going to make to the weapons involves the canned stone token. Now I'm not thrashing on the Aztecs, and anyone who knows me will tell you I'm actually a little bit obsessed with them, but I think it's a little bit ridiculous that this feature was added solely because of some clubs these guys carried around without being applied to what may be the most emblematic melee weapon of mankind for millennia, the stone spear. By adding the canned stone token to weapons, you enable that weapon to be crafted from an edge holding stone and a piece of wood in a craft dwarf's workshop. I'm going to give this token to the spear and large dagger object raws, as well as the axe that I put together earlier. 
I'm also going to lower the minimum size for this down to 5,000 so that it will pop up with creatures that use things like spears and blowguns. Technically, stone axes already exist in the vanilla game, though they are only craftable in adventurer mode. This is all I'm going to mess with in the weapons file for now. I'd like it if the ability to add skills was introduced so that I could flavorfully add things like atlatls, but for now, though you could technically use in-game skills for such a weapon, you're restricted to those hard-coded skills. I will mention here, however, that the alchemy skill is included in the game, though it has no current use. A dwarf can be given alchemy as a labor, so this is a perfectly viable skill to mod if you want to experiment with it. The same is true for animal caretaking, though the name of the skill is a little more creatively restrictive than alchemy. Now I'm going to play with some rocks. I'm going to open the inorganic stone layer file, which deals with the kind of stone that makes up the layers that you find when digging downward. There's only one rock I'm going to change up here, and that's chert. Basically, I'm a little bit tilted that obsidian is the only stone that can be used to make stone weapons. This might have to do with the fact that the only stone weapon is a Makwa wheat, which obsidian was used for, but when it comes down to it, plenty of stones were used for tools and weapons throughout prehistory, and if anything, obsidian is fairly rare in this category due to its regional restrictions and extreme brittleness. Other stones here are used in projectile points, for example basalt and quartzite, and when I'm being more thorough with the raws, I'll give edge values to a lot more stones, but in the interest of brevity, I'm only going to mess with chert in the layer stones. First, I'm going to give Chert the yield and fracture values of Obsidian so that it's at least useful against unarmored or lightly armored opponents in battle, as the default values for stone don't cut it. I'm then going to give it a max edge value of 15,000, a little less than Obsidian to reflect the superior sharpness of Obsidian. Any edge value above 10,000 will allow a stone to be used in weapons. Yeah, I'm done here and I'm going to save this and move on to the inorganic stone gem file. So I'm only going to do a couple of quick things here. One is I'm going to move Lapis Lazuli to stone, as it triggers me that it's considered a gemstone by this game. In fact, I have a lot of gripes with what are considered gemstones, such as jade, certain types of agate, and jasper, and there's no shortage of actual interesting gemstones that aren't included in games, so I'm not sure what the deal is. These stones being considered gemstones isn't what bothers me. That's how they are occasionally used in real life. What bothers me is that they aren't considered stones, so I can't do things like make bricks or furniture with them. Fortunately, because this is Dwarf Fortress, I can flex my own opinions onto the game directly and simply turn Lapis Lazuli into a processable stone. I'm only going to move Lapis Lazuli for this video, though. What I'm also going to do here is make it so that Rock Crystal shows up in veins in Metamorphic Rock. Since rock crystal represents crystalline quartz, which usually shows up in veins anyway, it's fairly flavorful. This is true, however, for a lot of gemstones and quote-unquote gemstones in this game. The reason I singled out rock crystal for this video is because it opens up a category in glass making that's otherwise difficult to pursue due to its scarcity. To make it show up in metamorphic veins, I just specify metamorphic as the environment, vein as the form it appears in, followed by the typical scarcity value of 100. Now I'm going to crack open the inorganic stone mineral file, and I'll be spending a little more time with this one. First things first, I'm going to get lapis lazuli in here as a proper vein stone. I've copied in the lapis lazuli information from the gemstone in it for reference, and I'm going to use a copy of the rods for cobaltite as a base, as the two share some traits in game. First I'm going to change the name to, well, Lapis Lazuli, and keep the color scheme the same as this color scheme comes out as blue mineral and gray stone in game. I'm then going to set the display tile as the percentage symbol. I'm removing the igneous occurrence that Cobaltite has as Lapis Lazuli is a metamorphic stone. I'm also removing the custom item symbol that Cobaltite and Cinnabar use so that it just shows up as a regular round stone when mined, as well as giving it a more reasonable density value. I'll then wipe out the gemstone information I pulled over so that it doesn't pop up in-game as a gemstone as well. And there you have it. Lapis Lazuli is now going to show up as a vein mineral. Next I'm going to make a quick change to Magnetite, and that is to allow it to show up in metamorphic layers as a vein mineral. Not only is this a more accurate representation of magnetite, which also regularly occurs in igneous extrusive environments, but it's a more accurate representation of the frequency of which iron ore occurs, which is a little bit unrealistically hard to find outside of sedimentary environments in this game. Even with this change, it's still rarer than it should be. 
I put it in veins only arbitrarily, as usually when found in metamorphic environments, it's found covering large areas. Speaking of veins, that's exactly what I'm going to turn orthoclase and microcline into. This choice has less to do with geology than other changes I've made. I just hate running into enormous yellow and blue blotches all over the place, though I don't mind so much with olivine due to its beauty and restriction to gabbro. I usually switch up mica too, but put a lot more work into it, as this is a reverse case of a stone that should probably be a gemstone. I mean, unlike most of the things considered gemstones in this game, mica actually has been used to make windows. Now I'm going to add a new stone entirely called flint. Flint is a type of chert found in chalk and limestone, so I'm going to copy over the information from chert. Chalk and limestone are made up of the remains of calcareous oceanic organisms being compacted over millions of years. Pockets of flint are the result of the remains of siliceous organisms being caught up in this process. The only reason I'm throwing in flint is because it fits with the theme of canned stone rocks I've had in this video, as well as I just really like the geological process. After copying over the information from chert to the mineral file, I'm going to of course rename it to flint. I'm then going to set the foreground color to 0 for blacks, and the brightness to 1 for dark gray. The 7 in the middle refers to the background color, which is light gray for regular stone. I'm also going to have this one show up as a percentage symbol in rock walls. I'm removing the sedimentary tag, as this is what causes chert to show up as a sedimentary layer. I'm then copying the occurrence information from malachite, as it's very similar to what I want. I'll switch marble over to chalk, as I don't believe flint survives the metamorphic process that causes chalks and limestones to turn into marble. I usually set it to small clusters, but it looks like I forgot. It doesn't matter too much anyways, it shows up both ways in reality. And that's all it takes to throw in a new stone. Now the last thing I'm going to do with the mineral file is adjust some material values. I'm a little bit irked that something like serpentine has the same value as schist or granite. There are a few stones that I've selected loosely that are usually a little harder to get a hold of and in demand for their appearance, and I'm going to knock their material value up to 2. These stones are jet, petrified wood, cryolite, serpentine, alabaster, selenite, satin spar, as well as a lapis lazuli that I added. And that'll be everything for the geographical changes in this video, but there's one more file that might be the most important one that I'm covering, and that's the entity default. This is the file that determines civilization information. You can use it to alter how the default civilizations function, or even create entirely new civilizations. Adding, say, a civilization of lion men is as simple as copying a different civilization's raws and changing a few things around if you want it to be that simple. So I'm going to make a few changes in here, the first of which being I'm going to give dwarves access to some of the weapons that I personally think they ought to have access to. Things such as mauls, flails, and morning stars especially, I think are dwarfy enough to be able to be crafted by dwarves. So I'm going to copy some of these item tokens from the humans and add them to the dwarven entity bras. I'm also going to grab capes, masks, and headscarves, because I like them. Do keep in mind that if you add masks to your dwarven civ file, they're going to wear them a lot, and they'll usually be made of metal. I like the idea of dwarves wearing metal masks as it gives them an interesting cultural dimension, but if you don't like the sound of that, I advise you against giving them access to the technology. You are nuts if you don't want your dwarves wearing capes, though. I'm also going to make sure the relevant civs have access to that axe I made in the weapon raws. I'll be giving the token to dwarves, humans, goblins, kobolds, and animal people, and not elves for obvious reasons. I'm also going to give the human and goblin entities access to most of the same permitted reactions that dwarves have access to in order to make them more technologically sophisticated. I'm doing this primarily to give them access to steel so that they have more teeth during conflicts. That's all I'm going to do here, but I do want to point out, as I had a lot of fun with this when getting to know the game, that by adding the Use Any Pet Race tokens to your Dwarven Entity Raws, the dwarves will be able to embark with and request in trade agreements any unaligned animals that your civilization has access to in the wild. Good token to grab if you want a steady supply of war rhinos. So that'll be all the changes I make in this video. If you want the files, they're linked in the description below. I usually go a lot crazier with the Raws than this, and I'm likely to do so in the near future. 